Right, folks, it is a rainy Saturday and I can't get out of my bicycle, motorised or human powered. So, therefore, I've got nothing better to do than have a look at the 2022 answers. I think what I'll do is I will rip through the simpler ones at super high speed and I'll slow down on the more complex ones. We'll see how that works for us. Once again, public health warning. Don't watch this if you don't feel like it. Um, if you start feeling bad while watching it because you realise you've made some mistakes, just stop. Wait for August. For the rest of us that are still listening, what we got? Um, explain why diatomic elements form non-polar molecules. Simple, there are identical electronegativity values for the elements' atoms. That's why. So, same EN values. Explain the decrease in covalent radius going from nitrogen to fluorine. Nitrogen to fluorine. <laughs> Can't find them on my own period table. Have you done much chemistry, hey? Um, simple answer there. Again, one mark. So there's an increase in nuclear charge, pulls the electrons in uh, to a tighter, basically. That's why they get smaller. First, ionisation energy. I wonder how much detail they're looking for here. Sorry. Uh, the paper on the screen. Um, I'm not sure they're going to work well. This question here asks us... Oh, hold on. Okay, this question is asking for the definition of the first ionisation energy. It's the energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of gaseous atoms. So I don't know how many of these keywords will be in the actual answer scheme, I'm afraid. That's why this is very much an unofficial answer scheme, but I'll do my best. Why the ionisation energy of the group seven elements decreases going down the group? Um, simple answer to that. Two options. There's two options. I'd probably accept either the outer electrons are further away or... Um, there are more layers of shielding. I don't think you need to have both of them because it's only one mark. More shielding layers of electrons between the outer and the nucleus. Does this fit on? Yes, it does. What's going on here? Hydrogen fluoride has the highest bond point to do to state the name of the strongest type of intermolecular force found. Well, that's hydrogen bonding, obviously. Um, how does this force arise? It arises... Well, I wonder what detail they're looking for again there. It's an extreme version of dipole-dipole interaction, effectively. It's caused by the fact, I'd probably draw a diagram. I think that might be the easiest way to do it. This is delta minus. This is delta plus in one molecule. This is delta plus in the neighboring molecule. And if I can do something exotic, like reach for a different color, then those are your hydrogen bonds. So it's an intermolecular force um, formed between hydrogen and nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Again, not totally sure what level of detail, but if it was my exam, I would have done something like that. Okay. Table shows the boiling points. Explain fully why the boiling point increases from hydrogen chloride to hydrogen iodide. This is all quite confusing. These are tough-ish questions. Because they mention hydrogen here again, so you might be inclined to set off on a tangent talking about hydrogen bonding. But there is no hydrogen bonding, because none of these are N, O, or F. So that means, what on earth is holding one molecule of HCl to its neighbours? This is an interesting question, actually. Because I normally would not have been too inclined to use these three compounds here, and here's why. Let me just check the data book. Right, back to my complaint. These are the electronegativity values for the three halogens here, and hydrogen, of course, is fixed at 2.2. That's a fatal difference. That's a difference of one. I mean, I'd be inclined to say that there's dipole-dipole interactions between an HCl and the neighbouring HCl, so I reckon there would be dipole-dipole interactions there. Whereas if you have a look at a hydrogen iodide, 2.7, 2.2, that's probably just van der Waals. But I think I'm overthinking this. I re... Two marks, maybe I'm not overthinking. Hmm. Let's assume that they're not looking for the dipole-dipole interaction. They're just looking for... the London dispersion forces. I think they're looking for you to say that the London dispersion forces between hydrogen iodide molecules are much stronger than the London dispersion forces between hydrogen chloride molecules, simply because of the number of electrons involved in this molecule is a lot less 
than the number of electrons involved in this molecule. I think that's probably enough to get you two marks. If, like me, you perhaps overthought it and thought this one is dipole... Sorry. Oh, no, no, in fact, no, ignore everything I just said. Ignore it. I've been raving like a lunatic. That's the coldest boiling point. That's the highest. Yep, that's fine. They're just looking for different strengths of London dispersion forces. Nothing whatsoever to do with dipole dipoles. Good, good. Quick balancing here. I started with the oxygens, made sure there was 12 oxygens on both sides, and uh, everything else falls into place. Uh, what's going on here? Calculate the volume of oxygen gas as a volume of gas reaction when 4.6 grams of potassium chloride decomposes. So we're interested in potassium chloride and oxygen. That is, again, there's no point in me watching this. Let's, let's save you some time. Okay, folks, so two moles makes three moles. Um, uh, that means two lots of this GFM makes three lots of this volume. So 245 grams makes 72 litres, but we don't have 245 grams, we have 4.6 grams. Do your cross multiplication, that pops out as your answer. Don't put a unit in, because the unit's in the question, as usual. Um, if you're uh, looking to generate work for yourself, then you can calculate the moles of each one, but you don't need to. Go and watch my video on gas volumes. You can just do it by proportion. It's much easier, less likely to make an error. State the effect of adenine catalyst on the enthalpy change. Trick question, no effect. Number three, firework. Um, okay, pause. Again, just proportionally here. 5.5 grams releases 103. Therefore, the GFM releases that. Just do it by cross-multiplication. Explain fully why increasing the temperature increases the rate of a chemical reaction. Two reasons for this. More collisions per second. Um, and number two, each collision has higher energy. Do you know what? I'm not even going to write this. You can just listen to me. Unless you're using subtitles, in which case the Google cannot cope with my accent. Um, what's going on here? This must be a problem-solving one. Flame colours associated with the different wavelengths are given in the data booklet. They are indeed. That will be essential for us to work out which metal has which colour. Let me just scroll down here, there we go. Metal flame colours in the data book, page 16. One particular firework, each peak represents a different colour of a light. There's your wavelength. They've sort of brought this in from advanced hires of problem solving. Peak A is a wavelength of 620 nanometers. 620 in your data book corresponds to calcium. That's easy. Anything else? Is that it? Oh, that was okay, because it was a problem solving, they made it nice and easy. First of our open enders, let's have a look. Discuss the importance of electronegativity in bonding structure and properties of compounds. Wow, um, that is such a nice open ender. I'm tempted to do a face reveal on that one. There we go. Um, so I, I would talk about maybe the definition of electronegativity. Um, I could talk about um, what effect it has on the bonds, so you can talk about polarised bonds. If you want to, you can then go on to talk about symmetry and the fact that polarised bonds don't always produce polarised molecules. With wee diagrams, they love wee diagrams like CF4, you know, that's your classic one you could put down there. Um, Although these bonds are polar, the molecules not. What else could you, you could then go on to say about the effect of polarised molecules, so you can discuss melting points, boiling points, and you can talk about dipole-dipole um, interactions, you can talk about uh, hydrogen bonding. You've easily got your three marks there. Now, you should be, should be good to go on that one, guys. No more time. We're going to spend on it. Functional group, the carboxylate group. Structural formula. For the carboxylic acid formed by hydrolyzing this, uh, just one mark, yeah, it's easy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight octanoic acid, but they don't want the name, they want the structure. So let's do, what's that supposed to be, hey? Honestly, call yourself a chemist. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And because I've got my degree in chemistry, it says on the bottom of my degree that I don't need to draw the hydrogens anymore. But you do, because you don't have your degree yet. That might not be true. An isomer of this, an isomer of this, um, with the same functional group, was hydrolyzed. One of the products was butanoic acid. Oh, okay, so we just rejig these carbons so that 
four of them are used in the butanoic acid side. So one, two, three. So that would be the butanoate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So if you use four here, you've got seven on the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't know why I'm drawing this. It's the name of it, you fool. So obviously that's heptan one all. I don't think you'll get it. Oh, sorry, not on the camera. I don't think you'll get it for heptan all. I think you would need heptan one all, guys. For that at a higher level, I'm afraid of. Sorry if anybody's kicking themselves there. Let's just check that. Hold on. Seven and four is eleven, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, yeah, good to go. Okay, scary chromatogram time. What's going on here? Chromatography. We've got absorbance. And we've got retention time. Oh, this is a form of gas chromatography. I did a video about this. Hopefully it might have helped somebody. Use the graph and the information in the table in bold. I wonder why that's important. Predict the number of carbons in glycerol trilorate. Okay, what's going on here? So glycerol tricaprolate is there. Glycerol tricaprate, yet yeah, pick words that are very similar to each other. That's helping everybody, isn't it? Actually, sorry, talking about that, I misread the question. That's the caprolate there. Then that's the caprate there. These must be retention times, these numbers here. And trilineolate is there. So if you've got 27 carbons, your retention time is 14. If you've got 33 carbons, your retention time is 16. And if you jump all the way up to 57 carbons, the retention time jumps up to 19. And we're looking for this one here, trilorate. Trilorate. Hmm, so... Difference here of two. I've gone up by four carbons. Sorry, can't I count. Six carbons. So the larger the molecule is, the larger the retention size. That's fair enough. I wonder how accurate they're looking for for a prediction. That's jumped up by just less than two. And they were jumped up by six carbons. The difference between trilinoleot at 57 carbons is just under 2 as well. So I wonder if they're expecting us to remove 6 carbons from this. Hmm. C49, I think, would be my sort of guess on that one. Sorry, it's off camera, guys. Not totally convinced, but that's only one mark. So I'm going to guess they're going to accept a decent amount of leeway on that. But um, hopefully you can see what I've done with the jump and retention time, matching that up to this corresponding, approximately corresponding jump and the difference in the number of carbons. I think that's the way to go. Prove me wrong in August when the marking scheme comes out. Identify the compound listed in the table, which is the most unsaturated. That's the ratio of hydrogens to carbons then. So 2 times 27 plus 2, hang on. Okay, so we've got the number of hydrogens it would be if it was totally saturated here. And here's the actual number of hydrogens from the table. As you can see, um, this one here has got the largest difference in hydrogens, so therefore it's the most double bonds. Edible. Oh, I hate this question. hate this question because the chemistry is wrong. Chemistry is just, no wonder my wife's throwing things around the room. I don't blame her, she's quite right. This, I keep telling SQ about this. See if anybody from SQ is watching this. Highly unlikely as that is. You show me the chemistry paper that says that you can react. I can't even remember what it is because it's wrong. It's edible oils. They say you can react edible oils with glycerol to make emulsifiers. And you flipping well can't. Ah, anyway, let's move on. Sorry, I'll keep my blood pressure down. Explain fully how emulsifiers prevent non-polar and polar liquids from separating into layers. Right. I'd probably do this diagrammatically. 
So something like this. Or the text version of this as well, of course. What we've got is we've got polar liquid here and we've got non-polar liquids here. Um, and if it was me in the exam, I'd probably just label these just to make sure these are hydrophilic. I, again, I'm not going to write this. This is not the same as my normal paper going over it. When I do, it's super quick. So hydrophilics dissolve in the non-polar. Hy hydrophobics dissolve in... Sorry. Hydrophilic dissolves in the polar. Hydrophobic dissolves in the non-polar. And I think for the final thing they might ask you about is why don't they just reform again? Well, these are negatively charged, which then means they repel each other. You get repulsion and it holds the little blobs apart. I think diagrammatically I'd do that. You can do it in text if you fancy but it's going to take you a heck of a lot longer. State the name of this alcohol. Uh, so one, two, three, four. So it's butan one all, and the methyl group is on one, two, three. Three methyl butan one all. That's easy. Propan one all is also found in fusel oil. Never heard of it. Um, Complete the iron electric equation. Oh, okay. So, stage one, balance the non-oxygen element, which is carbon is balanced. Stage two, balance uh, oxygens by adding waters. You don't need two. The oxygens are balanced as well. Stage three is balance the hydrogens by adding hydrogen ions, which means you'll need two hydrogen ions on this side. And lastly, you need to balance the charges so they're the same. So that would be a two electrons. There you go. That's an unusual one. You can see why they've done that. It's quite a sneaky question, but I like it. Suggest why the potassium dichromate must be acidified. Oh, because you need 14 hydrogen ions for every one dichromate ion. You need a bucket load of hydrogen ions. That's why you need to acidify it. That's my new SI unit, a bucket load. It's a bit less than a shed load, though. If I be colour change, acidified potassium dichromate goes from orange to bluey green. You just need to know that. Name the reagent that provides this oxidizing equation for the reduction. Uh, it could be... Used to oxidize propanol. Another oxidizing agent that could be used to oxidize. What? What's this question asking? Equation for the reduction of another oxidizing agent. Name the reagent that provides this ox. Well, oxidizing agents get reduced, so. There's reduction going on here, which this, this is your oxidizing agent, the silver ions. Are they looking for a chemical that gives you silver ions? Like silver nitrate? If it have to be silver nitrate, because it's soluble and it's AQ, you can use any other silver salt, I think, if I remember correctly. They're all insoluble. So silver nitrate, AQ. That's a weird question. Couldn't figure out what they were asking. It's a tertiary alcohol. Simple answer, 2-methylbutan tool. It can be oxidized, tertiary alcohol. What's going on here? The oxygen to hydrogen ratios in butanol. Are they actually asking you to work it out? Oh God, that's a bit donkey work, that sort of question. Hang on. Okay, that'll be that incredibly chemistry-related questions sorted out, eh? I suppose it is, that's a bit harsh, because it relies on you knowing what the structure of butanol is, but th those are the numbers. Sweet potatoes. An enzyme is a biological catalyst. Simple definition time. I don't know if they'll give you it for something that accelerates a reaction. I think they're looking... Listen, is somebody in the SQ been taking lessons out of biology's book? They're looking for precise one-word answers, you know, answers. I don't know. Don't know, I'm afraid. Find out in August. Circle a peptide link, that's easy. Draw a structural pro formula for one of the amino acids uh, used to form the protein. Let's pick the laziest one we can possibly do, which is that one. So N, you recreate that CH. Why have they done it that way? That's a weird way. Somebody know how to do it? An H up there. <laughs> done it on the cheap there, SQ. Right, next one. State what the term is. An essential amino acid, that's one that the human body cannot make for itself. You must get through your diet. The name of the type of reaction, joint condensation uh, reaction. Uh, fully what happens, hang on, sweet potatoes are cooked. The ability of the catalyst to break down hydrogen peroxide decreases. Well, my colleague, Miss McLeod, was talking to me about this one. We were trying to rack our brains on what you get the two marks for. Because the simple answer is the enzyme changes shape. 
but we thought to get the second mark, you probably need to say why it changes shape in that because you're breaking hydrogen bonds. Because that's what holds proteins in their shape. So we reckoned those were the two points on that one. Could be wrong though. Don't worry if you've got something different, it could be valid. Oh, this one as well. I was discussing this with Miss McLeod as well. This is a really unusual experiment drawing one because normally they give you the start and you have to complete it from there. But there is no start here. This is all we've got. Draw a diagram showing that could be used to measure... First of all, react hydrogen peroxide with sweet potato and measure the volume of oxygen produced. This one is actually, if you've got... Um, the nerve. If you hold your nerve on this one, it's actually not as bad as you think. So in here, we'd have to have some sort of container. I've just gone with a conical flask. Can use a beaker or a big boiling tube even for all the difference it makes. You're going to have a delivery tube coming out of here. And I think I would resort to my favourite. You measure the volume of oxygen produced. I think we're just going to stick it into a gas syringe. You could, of course, bubble the oxygen through water. Totally valid, even though I know, don't shout at me if it's out there. Oxygen dissolves in water a wee bit, I know. Ask the nearest fish. Um, let's just finish off this with stoppers, though. There and there. I'm not sure how well this is coming out um, on video. Can we assume? There we go. Um, so you need to seal that up there. Um, let's label things. So that is our gas syringe. Uh, do you need to label that as a delivery tube? Probably not. Um, you'll need to have some liquid in here, though. So H2O2 put a uh, solution. And chunks of sweet potato. Uh, any heating involved, Nathan? No. Oh, oh, color and the collective product. I only missed that. That's nasty. So that's your O2. Have I labeled that off camera? No, I haven't. I labeled some of it off camera. Sorry. There you go, guys. I think most people will get at least two out of three in that one. It's not quite as bad as I thought it was initially. Explain why antioxidants are added to food. They're added to food to... Uh, avoid damage to your DNA, basically. But I don't think that's probably not the words they're looking for. I wonder what they're looking for. Antioxidants get oxidized instead of your cells. Or to react with free radicals, probably that's it. I would imagine, though, at the markers meeting, there's a few different definitions that could be added here. But it's probably to react with free radicals in your cells. Uh, fully white soluble in water, two marks. Well, I'm seeing hydroxyl groups. Uh, lots of them here, in fact. Oh, yeah, tons of them. So, vitamin C is soluble in water for one mark, probably because it contains polar hydroxyl groups, and the second mark, perhaps, for saying that because polar things dissolve in polar liquids. Or maybe the second mark for saying it can form hydrogen bonds to the water molecules. I think probably either of these two might be acceptable. Proportion time. Let me just pause and work it out. Interesting. Um, took me a bit longer than I thought because initially I was reading this and getting puzzled by it. Surely there's a typo here, or certainly a grammatical error. Shouldn't it say here a typical white potato contain can contain 0 0.2 milligrams of solanine per gram of spud? Not 0 0.2 milligrams per gram of solanine. Anyway, that's just me whinging. So do the sums, and I reckon it comes out to 975 grams of spud. So that's a kilogram of potato, more or less. I think we're safe. This is true, by the way. Solanine is the same chemical that makes potatoes go green. Um, it's triggered on exposure to light, and it's poisonous, and it's designed to kill off rodents who are eating potatoes that have broken through the surface of the field. So that's why you should always keep your spuds in the dark. Ask my father-in-law. Let's move on. Natural gas is a source of methane. It is indeed. Uh, methane is burned to raise the temperature of oh, an enthalpy of combustion. Oh, it's an unusual enthalpy of combustion, though, which is why it's three marks. Because normally you're solving for the enthalpy of combustion itself, and they've actually given you the enthalpy of combustion here. They're asking you for the mass of methane. That would, assuming 100% transfer, by the way, which they haven't said either, should say that in words, assuming 100% efficiency. Um, I'll pause and work this one out. So the energy we need to generate 
is that number of kilojoules. As in the energy we need to release, sorry, to do the heating. Now they're telling us now that 891 kilojoules is released by one mole of methane. So 891 kilojoules would correspond to one mole. I'll tell you what I'm going to do now though, I'm going to replace that mole with this GFM because they're asking for a mass in grams. So they don't want a number of moles. So let's scratch that and replace it with 16 grams because that's the GFM of methane. So 891 kilojoules would be re re released by burning 16 grams of methane. We only need 11.286 kilojoules. So I reckon we'll do a cross multiplication and I'll get an answer for you. Yeah, not much. As you can see, 891 is from 16. We only need 11. So a quick sanity check proves that you should have a lot less than we're getting 0 0.203 actually to three significant figures otherwise known as 0 0.2026 grams. Not much methane. Oh, look, I'm doing what I tell my own students not to do. If the unit's in the question, don't put in the answer. Let's move on. Um, how far through this are we? I wonder. I'm not going to bore you all, guys. Hopefully you're finding this useful. Bond enthalpies. Using bond enthalpies from the data book. Oh, this is a bond breaking, bond making. Allow me to show all the bonds that we break and all the bonds that we make. In fact, we're doing it a different colour since we have the luxury. Apologies to anybody who's watching this who suffers from colour blindness. I love using different colours. It just must all look very monochrome to you. I'll be right back with the answers. Okay, this will be embarrassing in August if I get this wrong. But according to what I can see, the answer is negative 816. Is there an answer, Kiljo's? Yeah, there we go. Let's just leave it at that. Oh, helps when I show you my arithmetic, silly old fool. There you go, guys. Have a look at that. Breaking bonds in positive, making bonds in negative. That's meant to be negative there, by the way. So you can pause it and have a look. See if that looks even vaguely familiar. As I said, don't go... This is necess not necessarily gospel that I've got all these right. You know me. I'm famous for making a few mistakes here and there. Atom economy. Right. Have I missed something here? Or is this quite as easy as it looks? Three lots of hydrogen you're making on the right-hand side. So total mass of desired products is just hydrogen divided by the total mass of all the reactants times 100. That seems too easy for two marks. Tell me in the comments if I've missed something, which is entirely possible. 17.6%. <laughs> okay. Another natural current gas. Oh, okay. Uh, and equilibrium time. We're trying to drive nitrogen dioxide. Oh, we're trying to drive it backwards, actually. We're trying to drive it to the left. Now, this is for the forward reaction. So the forward reaction is exothermic, which means the backward reaction is endothermic. So you want high temperature. Uh, and there are um, two moles of gas on this side, only one mole of gas on this side. So you want low pressure. This is an interesting question. I know this question from a long time ago. Hess's law and bond making and breaking questions. This one here. Interestingly, in recent years have been dumbed down quite a lot to the extent where sometimes they actually showed you which bonds. You notice they didn't show you the bonds here. They're relying on you knowing the bonds in carbon dioxide or C double and O. In recent years, they were massively dumbed down in sober Hess's law. This is a Hess's law question from hell. And I recognize this one. From a long time, literally probably before most of you were born. I know this one from a long time. I'm going to hunt it down and see if I can find it in the question marks, in the past papers. Space shuttle? When was the last time the space shuttle was launched? Yeah, the space shuttle was retired in 2011. Bang up to date, SQA. Cutting edge questions. But I look at this. This is your target equation here. And these are the equations we can assemble to build this. If this had been my exam, I would have thought, you know what? Let's just come back to this another time. However, I'm going to pause and see what I can do. Actually, no, let's just talk it through. Hold on. We want four lots of this chemical here, which they don't actually tell you is methyl hydrazine. How are you supposed to know? Oh, that's, darn it, that's a pretty poor question. They should have put the blooming formula as that next to it. Anyway, so that's methyl hydrazine. 
Um, so where does this appear? It appears here, but it's on the wrong side and there's only one of them. So I reckon we need negative four times, call this equation one. Negative four times equation one. Uh, you need five dinitrogen tetroxides. And that appears in equation two and nowhere else, which is good news. And it's the wrong side again. Uh, so negative five times equation two. That's the equation, you know, the value. Carbon dioxide. Four of them on the right hand side. It's here and nowhere else. So I think we can just go with four lots of equation three. 12 waters. Hmm. And we need nine nitrogens as well. Oh, that's okay, there's nitrogens here, so they will probably add up to nine. 12 waters in the form of gas. So the waters would have to be on the right-hand side, which you see here which is fine, so you need 12 watts of equation four. So what's equation five for? Well, equation four ends with liquid water, and finally, you're gonna to have to convert it to gas, and because there's 12 of them, you're actually gonna need 12 watts of equation five. I don't think many people in Scotland will be getting the marks for this. I'm not entirely sure I've got the marks for it either. If this was, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to punch in these numbers and just end up with a number and see if it sounds vaguely correct, but don't take my word for this. Also, if this was my exam, I would actually go back and do a horrendous big evaluation. I would actually multiply each of these reactants and products and put them through what I call in my class simultaneous equations, cancel everything out and see if I did end up with my target equation here. Um, but I'm just going to do the numbers version here. According to what I can see, that in theory is our answer. Which, by the way, is there any way to do a sanity check on this? Yep. If you're talking about rocket fuel, you better first of all be exothermic, and it's a hell of a big exothermic kick to make you leave the planet. Full structural formula for me. Oh, methyl hydrogen. Oh, yeah, now give the formula. It's problem solving time, guys. Um, I'll just draw out the correct one. If you've got another one that matches and all the bonds are still correct, then it's all good. A hydrazine. I'm just showing off here because I know what hydrogen looks like. A little bit of flex in terms of chemistry. So nitrogen three. Oh no, no, he said flex and then gets it wrong. <laughs> uh, that doesn't match up to that. Hmm. That must be a single bond, then you daft old fool. Yeah, flex, because you know what uh, hydrazine looks like, hey, and then get it wrong. That's interesting. There we go. Happy with that? So three bonds on here, three bonds on here, four bonds on here. <laughs> I'll teach you. Stand there and rant at the SQ, then you get one of your own answers wrong. Um, feature of the reaction. What's going on here? Catalyst for this reaction is copper two oxide. Put the table by circling one option on each line to show the effect of copper two oxide on the reaction. Oh, almost a trick question time. Catalysts always increase reactions, both forwards and backwards. Position of the equilibrium, no effect. There we go. Water gas shift reaction is exothermic. As in the forward direction, left to right is exothermic. Um, that means the yield of carbon dioxide, which side is carbon dioxide on? Carbon dioxide on the right hand side. So as you crank the temperature up, then you'll get less and less carbon dioxide made. So something along the lines of that. Don't know if that, ex yeah, I don't see why they wouldn't accept a curve or a straight line. It's all good as long as you start high and end up low. That's all they're looking for there. Number eight. Uh, show by calculation that sorbic acid is the limiting reactor. In other words, sorbic acid all gets used up. Right, let me do that for you. Lighting's going very odd on my phone here. The pixel is looking very blue. I think I'd be inclined to do this by proportion. I normally do it by moles. 112 grams would require one mole of KOH. Seven grams uh, of sorbic acid would require... Let's have a look. Um, not much. 0 0.0625 moles 
of potassium hydroxide. Let's have a look at our volume and our concentration. We've actually, that's required in order to use up all of this. We're trying to prove that that's going to happen. So we've got a concentration of 0 0.5 and we have a volume of 0 0.25. So 0 0.2 times 0 0.25, I can do that in my head, is 0. Okay, hold on. Get that wrong. Oh, haha, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.0625. That's more like it. I was about to say, mm, we would, uh, we have actually got 0. 0.125 moles of potassium hydroxide, and in order to burn up 7 grams, which is how much we've got, of the sorbic acid, we would only require 0. 0.0625. Therefore, we have excess potassium hydroxide. In other words, this is the limiting reagent. Quite nice two marks. How far through this are we, guys? I don't want to bore you to death here. could split the video, couldn't I? Ah, no, we'll just push on. I'll just do it quickly if I can. I'll let you have a look at this question, then I'll calculate it, and then I will unpause it again. Right. Um, this weird thing here is problem solving from advanced hire. One gram in 100 is 1%. One so that percentage is that in 100. We need 330. So we need that in terms of mass. But they're asking for moles just to be awkward. So it's mass over GFM, given in the question, comes out to be a tiny number of moles, 2.52 to the negative 5. Okay. That's a quite nasty one because that's such a stupidly small number. You would suspect that you've done it wrong. Property of an essential oil. They are non-polar. They dissolve in non-polar solvents. What else? Uh, oh, low boiling points. Uh, very volatile. That's probably what they're looking for. There are a few answers that might go in there. Name the type of compound when isoprene units join together. Terpenes. You've made a terpene. A terpene, as Dr. Borthwick calls them. Isoprene is also, draw the structural formula for isoprene, uh, it's something like 1,3-butadiene, it's something like that, isn't it, if I remember correctly. Uh, the hydrogen's in, one hydrogen here, no hydrogen's there, two hydrogen's there. So that'll look a bit right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, C5, H8, yep. State the number of isoprene units in a zinger bean molecule. Oh, this is multiples of C5H8-ish. Sometimes that can vary a wee bit. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I'm going to go with 3. Simple answer for that. 3. Gingerol is another compound from the ginger root. What's going on here? Gingerol can be changed into that. Sounds like a character from the Marvel Universe. Name product X. Um, hmm. What's changed? We've lost the OH and the H. Oh, I see what they've done. This is actually the opposite of addition, which is quite sneaky, because that's only a concept that we really throw in advanced higher, so that's sort of why it's problem solving. H and OH, you've lost water. Of course you have. The water's been peeled off. Name two functional groups present in ginger ale and sugar ale that are not present in... Oh, right, so zinger bean is boring. It's just carbons and double bonds. This has got, well, hydroxyl and carbonyl. Yeah, hydroxyl and carbonyl. That'd be your two answers, wouldn't it? There's hydroxyls. Um, we don't know what that is at this point in time, interestingly. You don't know what a COC bond is. Not until next year. For a particular style of reaction, how can the actual yield as a quantity? Some reactions, along with the desired products, are shown below. Reaction product. I'm going to pause this and think about this one. This is an interesting open ender in that it's not actually very open. There is a correct answer for this one. And it seems to be no coincidence that they've given you three different reactions you want you to talk about. And there's three points, of course. So I'm assuming here that they're wanting you to be able to identify how would you isolate these products from the reactant mixture. That's not really an open-ender. Because the only way to isolate a solid from a solution is filtration. Flit, sorry, filtration. So filter it. Two liquids mixed together, that would be distillation in order to remove this chemical here, the ester. 
and then sod and a gas well just collect the gas. Um, so gas collection. So it's diagram time really for this one, isn't it? I always say this is more of a practical question to open it. But anyway, I'm, I'll shut up there. This is an unusual one. We'll see how you got on with this one, folks. But I think that's what they're looking for. On the other hand, you know how open-enders work. Don't panic if you haven't done this. It does mention specifically, see, determining the yield. Describe how the yield in a reaction could be determined. So this is why it's not a very good open-ender. Because there's sort of only one way to do it. We are getting there, folks, on the home stretch now. <laughs> nice example of me burning my own time in exam there. It would help if I'd read the question carefully. I thought it was 1, 3 and 5 for some bizarre reason. 3, 4 and 5. I took a good three minutes trying to find a pattern in the wrong three. So, you know what the story of the, it goes there is, I, if you're stuck on something for so long then either pass on it or think, have I missed something? Which I went for the second option. Right, basically 3, 4 and 5, as you can see, the more fluorines you have, the less damaging it is to the ozone. Or, of course, the more chlorines you have, the more damaging it is. I think they'll take either of these two. One and five um, are what you're looking for there because they've swapped two um, bromines for two chlorines. This is an interesting one. The refrigerants, carbon dioxide and ammonia have zero values of ozone depletion. Suggest why this is the case. I'm not sure what they're looking for. No halogens, maybe, in them? No halogen atoms at all? Um, might be as simple as that. Not entirely sure. It's only one mark, so can't be that much. Let's push on, guys. A free radical is an atom with a an unpaired electron. It's just definition time. You have to know what that definition is. An unpaired electron, whatever that might mean. They haven't explained it, but they want you to know it. Good science. That is an initiation step because you have no radicals. You have two radicals. Write an equation for a possible propagation step. Propagation starts with a radical, so we'd have to have a fluorine radical. What's it reacting with? Um, it's made by reacting fluorine gas with fluoromethane. So, CH3F. Now, there's probably a couple of different answers you can have for this one, but in reality, what you probably end up with would be HF, it would pinch an H off there, and you'd end up with a second radical, which in this case would be CH2F, and you need the dot on there. The dot can go in sort of anywhere, really. Let's do this last proportion calculation. Right, are we on camera? Yes, we are. Okay, so 0 0.025, because it's 50% of the mass. By the way, I'm assuming they should have said 50% of the mass, just in case you thought that was 50% of the moles, interestingly. So 0 0.025, turn it into um, grams, of course, don't put 0 0.25 over there, because the gram formula